Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. Being a mutant can come with some impressive powers, like shooting lasers from your eyelashes or communicating with trees. Though there's that whole world hates and fears you thing. But if someone is adapted to this way of life, what happens when those powers just up and leave? I'm taking issue with an X-Men three-parter I'm tentatively calling Oh the Humanity. Let's see if this story makes us want to turn the page or turn our heads. We begin with Uncanny X-Men number 379, the cover of which features a literal spotlight on Cyclops' busted visor. And of course, the warranty just expired. That's how they get you. Storied by Alan Davis, with art by Tom Rainey, Scott Hanna, and Brian Haberlin, we begin as Charles Xavier holds a Shi'ar Hall Empathic Matrix Crystal. His narration describes the space trinket as containing the personality and physical representation of people who have passed on so they are, in a way, still alive. However, while paraphrasing Shakespeare, he laments the death of Scott Summers, a two-page spread as Chuck narrates his purpose of building a school to bridge the gap between mutants and humans. And it is a long, flowery explanation while we see a bunch of different mutant teams, past and present, as well as solo acts, and while it's a legacy he's proud of, losses like Scott don't make it much easier to bear. And take note of Mero next to Gambit and Rogue. I wonder if they're all discussing that alternate possible future they were in, where she and LeBeau settled down and got old, while Rogue retained her youth and flirtatious demeanor. Anyway, the funky space gem was a gift from Kitty Pride and Colossus to remember the team while the professor heads into space to find a place for Squirrel mutants. He boards the ship to take off, and I guess everyone else already said their goodbyes? Or maybe they're all just ghosting him? Pyotr is sure he'll return after they launch, but Kitty muses that there may be more to experience in life than an ex-uniform. And perhaps she ought to explore them, since she's... barely 16? I know time passes differently for comic book characters, but this one premiered in 1980 at 13 years old. And here, in 2000, she's only aged three years? That seems a bit nuts. Not to mention some stories before this that drew her a bit older than 16, let's say. As the ship flies off, Charles can detect Kitty's feelings of abandonment, despite her being quiet while he prepared to leave. But he thinks she'd do the same in his place. We jump to one of my personal favorite things the X-Men do in their downtime, baseball, as narration switches to Storm, musing how her dad loved the game, how Nightcrawler's unique fingers would make him a Hall of Famer, assuming mutants would be allowed to play, and how she's currently manipulating the midwinter weather for something more game appropriate. How many snowmen died for this game? How many? Though I'd like to specify, it's not that I have any special love for baseball, I generally don't care, but I do like that the X-Men play baseball. Mero hits the ball and it ends up beelining for Aurora's head, but fortunately stopped by Wolverine. Her head was in the clouds, because even though recent chaos should let them better appreciate this kind of downtime, she feels a greater threat is on the rise, because there always is. She fears they may not survive it either. As the other X-Men gather around, but don't participate in cheering her up, Logan says whatever happens, they'll find a way to win. How depressing is it that the amnesiac berserker has to give the pep talks around here? We head to Genosha, where Magneto muses to Polaris his dreams for the island, which he awkwardly specifies is just north of Madagascar. Yeah, sounds totally natural that way. As it is, he needs to quell some warring factions, but with his magnetic powers waning lately, he needs the assistance of the like-powered young woman. He can't risk showing weakness after the UN allowed him sovereignty, and with her aid, he can possibly even surpass his previous power to remake the world. As they head out to deal with the conflict, Polaris internally admits that working with Magnus may be a deal with the devil, but heightened stakes compel her to try helping him out anyway. Then it's to Mystique, infiltrating the National Reconnaissance Office at the NSA, where just about anyone can be tracked and details about them discerned. First disguised as an old lady, then turning into an agent, she narrates having once been the deputy head of DARPA, and that she's currently here because a bunch of aliases she uses have been uncovered, and she wants to know who's responsible. One of those aliases was this close to being approved for a boat loan, and she was eyeing a gently used schooner within her price range. Back to Genosha. Fabian Cortez, one of the mutants in the X franchise who doesn't get a power-based codename, is in Magneto's throne, 
telling the Acolytes that his ability to augment powers is what's been giving Magneto his strength, each charge taking more effort and fading faster. When he suggests what could happen if their enemies found out, he's flung out and into a pillar, by none other than the leader against whom he's teasing treason. It's so hard to find good help these days. Polaris hopes his rage is for show, but wonders what she'll do, what she can do, if he takes steps she doesn't agree with while using her powers. We check in on Jean Grey, recalling that she died and got better, so maybe the same thing will ring true for her husband. Kind of makes you wonder whether or not she considers herself a widow. She's approached by Nate Grey, the alternate universe version of Cable, who still feels guilty that Cyclops died saving him from Apocalypse. Jean tells him, yet again, not to blame himself, adding that Scott always found the paths to victory, and it was underestimating him that proved N. Sabanor's undoing. If young Nate wants to honor the sacrifice while calling himself X-Man, he should better act the part. Why is he flying away like he's listening to an epic 80s power ballad? In a nondescript hideout, Blob is explaining a heist to Toad, Mimic, and Post. Paradigm Micronics was recently absorbed into Deterrence Research Corporation for its patents and designs. There's a new prototype weapon built by Paradigm that the DRC doesn't know about, but somehow Blob does and he intends to steal it and sell for profit. Then back to Genosha, uh, again, because I love when comics jump back and forth all around like this. Well, Beast has managed to talk Iceman into ice traveling across a thousand watery miles to the home of their biggest enemy, except when he's not, all for doing research on the legacy virus. It's currently dormant, but as it specifically targets mutants, someone could find a way to activate it for deadly purposes. Genosha, having a population of natural-born mutants and mutates whose powers were engineered, could yield some fruitful results, despite the dangers involved. He discovers mutants can reduce their risk through wearing face masks and washing their hands until a cure is found. But for some reason, there are some that end up listening to the Friends of Humanity when they start editing McCoy out of context and claim the legacy virus is a Genosian hoax. It's post-game at the Xavier Institute, as the players are chilling out when appears a hologram of the High Evolutionary, self-proclaimed Grand Poobah of the world's genetic potential. Weird, Gambit references Storm's lion analogy from earlier, even though she said it through narration. Anyway, H.E. has decided that mutants are a huge threat to the planet and its inhabitants. Even though they can do good with those powers, they can still arbitrarily affect the Earth's fate. Storm counters that he's just as susceptible to being led astray by his own abilities and hasn't the right to pass any judgment. When I do it, it's cute! In a case of doesn't count when I do it, the evolutionary doesn't want to do nothing, but assures he won't harm them. He's developed a series of satellites to create an energy field to neutralize the X-gene, and claiming to have considered every argument, feels it necessary that the few hundred can be sacrificed to save billions. The team doesn't like the sound of this and wants to do something, but Kurt figures they wouldn't be getting this exposition if his plan wasn't already in motion. I guess Nightcrawler is Red Watchman once or twice. Evolutionary even throws in that they'll never face the threat of Magneto again, and the scorn they've suffered will end. Wolverine, not thinking it should be so easy, asks why he doesn't make the world a single race or sexual orientation, which gets no response. I'm not on trial here. Am I? So much for considering every argument. The backfire effect can be a doozy no matter how intelligent you are. Unfortunately, it tends to be a doozy for everyone else. Logan further points out a bunch of non-mutants that have power to do a lot of damage, and how the Avengers won't like this assault on their mutant teammates, like Firestar or the Maximoff twins. But the Evolutionary isn't concerned, so activates his field. On the two-page spread, we see various mutants as their powers vanish. Flyers dropping, some seeming to sense in some way that their powers are gone, and the techno-organic virus going smorgasbord on cable. It's particularly inopportune for Genotians, as described aloud by Magneto, anticipating old scores being settled against him. Mystique is exposed and promptly arrested, and Blob's crew react to their reversion, working out better for some than others, with Toad becoming all man-pretty and Fred Dukes being covered in excess skin. This is gross! Well, there is a bright side. Think of the tax write-off you'll get from donating all that skin! As for McCoy and Drake, the former notes that whatever's happening is reorienting the X-Gene into what they'd be if mutancy wasn't a thing, instead of merely preventing access to those abilities. He suspects the High Evolutionary, conveniently, 
but does note that something like this is beyond what he's been known to utilize, so it raises the question of who provided him with the new gear. The last page is on the X-Men as the evolutionary hopes that they'll find a way to embrace this change. Take comfort that, in a way, their mentor's dream of unity between mutants and humans has come to pass. Just, you know, without the mutants. Well, we can all certainly understand that. That was part one of Oh, the Humanity. Kind of a slowly paced start to a new threat, but not without merit. They did just fight Apocalypse, one of their biggest foes, if not the biggest, who'd just been screwing around with all of time and space after assimilating their fearless leader. The quiet moments do make for a good breather before jumping into something else. However, I think this issue would have flowed better if instead of just bouncing between locations so much in so few pages, that maybe they reshuffled them a bit. The X-Men for the first few pages, then Mystique for one, Blob's gang for another, then had the pages on Genosha one after the other. Then return to the X-Mansion when the High Evolutionary's hologram appears, the field activates, and we see the fallout with those other characters before ending on the team. It did get a little wordy with long monologues and exposition-heavy word bubbles telling us what most readers would already know, maybe because there wasn't enough to fill out the issue otherwise? But most importantly, what is this thing on the High Evolutionary's helmet? I like this. It's an idiot handle. But there will be plenty for the ex-mutants to do next week as they acclimate to their newfound powerlessness, in different ways. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues.